Sarah and made them a number of promises to bless them, to give them a multitude of descendants, and to give them a land of their own. Abraham and Sarah waited 20 more years before they welcomed their son Isaac. God continued to bless them. Isaac and his wife Rebecca had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. Jacob became known as the clever trickster, cheating his older brother out of both his birthright and the blessing of the firstborn. Jacob ran away to escape the wrath of his brother and ended up marrying two sisters, Leah and Rachel. While Leah bore Jacob many children, the barren Rachel was his beloved. After many years, Rachel finally bore Joseph, who quickly became Jacob's favorite son. As Joseph grew up, Jacob's favoritism became very clear, as he gave Joseph a special, colorful coat. Joseph wasn't very humble, either, flaunting his fancy dreams in front of his ten older brothers. Those brothers were jealous and resolved to kill Joseph. In the end, they resorted to selling him into slavery in Egypt and telling their father Joseph was killed by wild animals. And that is where today's story continues. Good morning. Today's reading comes from Genesis chapter 39, verses 1 through 23. Now Joseph was taken down to Egypt at Potiphar, an officer of the Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the Ishmaelites who brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. He was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. He made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From the time that he made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and with him there he had no concern for anything but the food that he ate. Now Joseph was handsome and good-looking. After a time, his master's wife cast eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look with me here. My master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my hand. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not consent, consent to lie beside her or to be with her. One day, however, when he went into the house to do his work, and while no one else was in the house, she caught hold of his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. When she saw he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called out to the members of the household and said to them, See, my husband has brought among us a, a Hebrew to insult us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And when he heard me raise my voice and cry out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Then she kept his garment by her until his master came, came home, and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant, whom you have brought among us, came in to me to insult me. But as soon as I raised my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. When his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, saying, This is the way your servant treated me, he became enraged. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. He remained there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. He gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's care all of the prisoners who were in prison, and whatever was done, he was the one who did it. The chief jailer paid him paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care, 
because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you were to draw a horizontal line that represented your life, what, what would it look like? Would it be pretty steady with a few mild ups and downs, a few peaks, a few valleys? Is there a part of your life that you illustrate with a very deep valley and another with something resembling a high mountain? I think for many of us, the timeline of our lives would be kind of like this. We all have some highs and lows, great joys and celebrations, sorrows and times of suffering, and a lot more kind of level places in between, right? And then there's Joseph. Joseph's birth was the high point of his parents' lives. For years, Jacob and Rachel had hoped for a child, and Joseph was the best gift they could ask for. And Jacob spoiled Joseph, which was a problem, because Joseph wasn't Jacob's only son. He was his 11th son. And you know what sibling rivalry is like when one child is favored over all the others. There's extreme bitterness. Not only that, but Joseph had unique dreams that clearly showed that he would be superior to his brothers in some way, and they would bow down to them. And, of course, Joseph bragged to his brothers about the dreams, that, and it often got him into trouble with them. Would any of us fault the older brothers for at least kicking Joseph under the dinner table? But as brothers sometimes do, they took their grudge too far, way too far, in this case. Where Joseph's childhood was mostly lived way up high on the mountaintop, being the favorite son, blessed by parents and by God, with unique possessions and abilities, Joseph was soon plunged into some of the deepest pits imaginable, both literally and figuratively. His brothers conspired to kill him and threw him into a pit, Sure, maybe snotty Joseph deserved a time out, but he certainly didn't deserve to be killed. After a more practical brother spoke up, the brothers decided that killing Joseph wouldn't be as profitable to them as selling him into slavery and reporting him as dead, killed by wild animals. Now that's a plan. So how are you feeling about your family right now? Not as dysfunctional as you thought, right? Joseph's family drama makes our family drama feel like nothing. So Joseph went from being the beloved golden boy to being thrown into a pit by his brothers to being sold into slavery by those same brothers. He was taken away from his beloved father, from his home, from everything he had ever known to be enslaved and owned by strangers in a foreign land. I don't know about you, but the lows of my life don't begin to compare to those horribly tragic events of Joseph's life. But things were about to look up for Joseph, not because he was such a great guy, but be because the Lord was with Joseph, we are told. God is hardly mentioned at all in the 14 chapters that talk about, Jacob's, about Joseph's life. But God is in this chapter, chapter 39, a lot. Several times, we hear that God was with Joseph in his suffering. Potiphar, the Egyptian who had bought Joseph, saw that God was with Joseph and began entrusting important parts of his household to him. And the more responsibility he gave to Joseph, the more successful Potiphar became because the Lord was with Joseph. So although Joseph was a slave, he was treated as an important, vital member of the household. From a low point to a high point for poor Joseph. Until, until we meet Mrs. Potiphar. At that point, Joseph was on top, managing things seamlessly for Potiphar's household. Everything was going well until Mrs. Potiphar ruined his life. 
This episode wasn't just a cute little flirtation or an innocent crush. It was a manipulative power play by a woman with power to seduce a man without power. As a slave, Joseph wasn't supposed to say no to his owners. But as a faithful slave of her husband, Joseph could not say yes to his master's wife. He was utterly trapped by her harassment. And when she wouldn't take Joseph's repeated no for an answer, her sexual harassment ventured into aggression, grabbing Joseph by the clothes, after which Joseph refuses her and runs away naked without a choice. And in the moments that follow, Mrs. Potiphar quickly flips the story around, accusing innocent Joseph of attacking her and playing the victim. Only moments after Joseph was on top of the world, a trusted manager of a prominent Egyptian, he's thrown into prison with no evidence, no trial, not even a sentence to give him a clue of when he could be released. What's worse than being a slave? Being a prisoner in a land with no family and no hope of release. Joseph was once again left in the pits of despair, due to no fault of his own, with nothing. Well, maybe not with nothing. Joseph had no family, no lawyer, no possessions, no money, no real rights. But once again, we hear that Joseph had God's steadfast love. The reminder that God was with Joseph in the worst times of his life. And once again, God helped Joseph turn things around. Just as Potiphar had trusted Joseph to do everything, God helped the jailer to trust Joseph, enough to give him great responsibility in the jail. And once again, things went well for everything that was under Joseph's care. Eventually, Joseph's ability to interpret dreams brings him to the attention of the Pharaoh, which quickly lands Joseph in, as second in command for all of Egypt but not before he's forgotten in prison for a good long time. Joseph's whole story is this timeline of dramatic highs and lows, which is why it makes such a great story and a pretty fun musical. We tend to focus on the joyful parts of Joseph's story and how he became such a capable, important man. Go, 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 Joseph, you know what they say. Hang on to Joseph and you'll make it someday. But we can't forget that what, what it must have been like for Joseph to go through all of those terrible things, which were entirely out of his control. Imagine being thrown in a pit by your brothers, sold into slavery, falsely accused, and imprisoned. Those lowest of lows shaped Joseph's life and his faith. It reminds me a bit of a writing by Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel in his book, Night. There's a part where a young boy was caught for collaborating against the Nazis. So he's taken to a concentration camp and hanged while others in the concentration camp were forced to watch. The poor child was small, so he didn't die quickly, which utterly horrified those who were forced to watch. As they watched the poor boy struggle, someone cried out, Where is God? Where is God now? And Eli Wiesel hears a voice inside himself replying, Where is God? Here he is, hanging here on the gallows. So often, some Christians try to portray God as being all about success and joy and victory. When you're in a high point in your life, it's because God loves you and God's blessed you and you deserve it. When you're faithful to God, good things happen to you. The problem is, when bad things happen to you, how do you explain that? Some Christians would say bad things happen to us because we're not faithful enough to God that if we were just better Christians, everything would be perfect and shiny and beautiful. But Joseph's story would hear that mentality and say, that is absolute garbage. Genesis 39 shows us that sometimes really awful things happen that aren't our fault. Sometimes they are. But 
And it's the but that's really important. In those awful times, God is with us just like he was with Joseph. Each time Joseph experiences a super low low, we hear that God was with him. Joseph was never really alone. And that means something for us. We don't just have a God who celebrates and parties with us when things good happen. We have a God who joins us in the pits and the prisons of this life to help us through. Sometimes, like Joseph, we get out of those pits and prisons to live a brighter day. But sometimes, when we're really stuck, God simply pitches a tent, literally, dwelling there with us, loving us and supporting us through the pain so we're never alone. Because we have a God who knows what suffering is like, right? God didn't send Jesus to avoid pain and suffering. Jesus came to suffer just like we do, to feel human pain and loneliness, to learn how best to accompany us in our pain. And yes, Jesus came to rise from the dead and defeat the power of death for us. But first, he had to die in an ugly, horrible way, which many Christians want to gloss over with the shininess of the resurrection. But it's Jesus' suffering and death that made resurrection possible. And it's the fact that God understands our pain and accompanies us through it that makes our faith deep and complex and real. Even when life stinks and when others might abandon us, God is always there for us. Always. Joseph became the capable, compassionate man he was because God was with him during the lowest times of his life. It was God who helped Joseph to be able to say to his brothers, even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good. God didn't cause Joseph's suffering, but God has a way of working through suffering to make incredible things happen. That is our God, dwelling with those who suffer, walking with us as we struggle, encouraging and blessing us through the low points of our lives, not just to bring us to better times, but to let us know that God abides with us always. Always. 